Okay. Well, I actually do almost always, everything I've written is about food, eating of it. Um, so this is kind of an anomaly, not eating, and why people would do it. Um, aesthetically, it's not where I'm, I am. And actually, I'm kind of, I've been working on this research for, oh gosh, about five years now. And honestly, it's hard to get into. You know, you kind of, you, you get, you know, when you're writing cookbooks and talking about um, food from all sorts of different angles, it's very, it's a lot of fun. You know, we talk about cooking and um, fine dining and things like this. This is kind of a sour subject. So, so I've put off writing a book on it. I will eventually, um, probably UC Press will, will do it. Um, at least I've expressed interest. But let me tell you how I, how I got to this, because it may seem weird for someone who is a self-confessed foodie um, to write about not eating. Um, my period is, is Renaissance Europe, so that's my specialty. That's what my training was in. And um, got into food really because I needed a, a dissertation topic. And my advisor said, you know, actually, it's a really weird story. I was at Columbia. And he said, um, go across the park and go into the New York Academy of Medicine and take a look and see what they have there. And I was like, why? I had never, no interest in medicine. I had not, you know, never on my radar. And he said, because they have comfortable chairs. And he was absolutely right. Because <laughs> I sat there for about three years and, and just, you know, read everything that was, was written. Um, really good collection of dietary um, material. So I started sort of half in the history of medicine and half in food, what people thought they should be eating. And what's strange about that experience, there's about, I would say, maybe 150 books on that topic. Um, what's strange about the experience is, you know, when you read enough of anything long enough, you kind of begin to believe what it says and you start to self-diagnose and you start to become your subject. So, so I actually had a 16th century humoral body for many years. <laughs> I couldn't eat cucumbers. It would give me phlegmatic humors, things like that. I'm really <laughs> glad I'm over it. But it was... But it's partly why this topic on fasting frightens me a little, is that I'm going to start wanting to do it. And actually, when I first started the whole thing, I thought, um, well, I should really give it a shot, see what happens, try a real medieval fast, which is, strangely enough, it doesn't involve not eating at all. It involves um, avoiding meat and dairy products and eggs, milk, butter. Um, fish is okay. That seems really weird. Um, and vegetables and everything are okay. But it's one meal a day, and for that whole period of Lent for 40 days, you, you have um, vegetables, basically. You know, vegetarian, um, almost vegan, you could say, except for the fish. So I thought, let me do this. Let me see what it's gonna, you know, what effect it will have. And I had this suspicion that um, people who did severe abstinence and really cut down their calories probably were hallucinating. And it was just sort of this intuition that when you talk about a real ascetics who are self-punishing kind of people, that they probably get to a point where they begin to see visions and describe them in their books. And that's, so I was, you know, coming at it from a very rational standpoint. And I just wanted to know what's gonna happen to my body when I start fasting. So I did it for 40 days. Um, and for a glutton, that's, that's hard. <laughs> um, and the most, I, I have to admit, the hardest thing was not drinking either. A real medieval fast uh, doesn't involve wine either. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Um, and it was St. Patrick's Day, for which, you know, Irishmen get dispensations and so that sort of thing. But I didn't want to do it. I went 40 days, and I was at least expecting I would feel better, I would look better, I don't know I, what, what I thought it would do. Um, it did nothing, absolutely nothing for my body or my mind. Or, and I said, I'm never doing this again. I bought a steak and got a big bottle of bourbon, and I said, forget it, I'm not doing this. So, so you can understand why I'm a little frightened about going back into this, into this research. But let me tell you, explain how it happened. Um, I kind of... I write a lot, so you know, I, books just sort of fly off, <laughs> off uh, out of my computer. Um, but there are, my sort of serious academic work usually focuses on the Renaissance and something to do with food. So I did a book on um, nutritional theory in the Renaissance. I did a book on fine dining in the Renaissance. I did a cookbook based on Renaissance stuff. Um, so I thought I pretty much got it. Most things covered, but I don't have religion. What? How did religion affect the way people were eating? You know, why did they stop? Um, you know, why did they fast during Lent and various other days throughout the calendar? What, what were they thinking about food? And it turns out that the, the Reformation era is really, really interesting because all of these things come up, um, are thrown up into the air again, uh, you know, wondering what, what should we be eating and why? And I'll, I'll explain so, some of those arguments just in, in brief and, and then maybe make some global comparisons. Incidentally, it's Ramadan. I don't know whether you knew that. So <laughs> there must not be Muslims here because <laughs> everyone's eating. But, um, but the... Um, so in any case, I 
thought, all right, I'm going to need to get a grant, read this material. The vast majority of it is theology, which I kind of, I teach a Reformation um, history course, much of which is theology. So I thought this will be fun. I'll just dive in and see what happens. Um, the research has changed. When I, when I started this, this is about um, five years ago. You need a big sort of grant. You get money. You go away for a whole summer. You just plop yourself in a library, and you just read everything that has to do with this topic. Um, and I knew that there was a really good library in a place called Wolfenbüttel in, in Germany. Charming little town, uh, 17th century bishop, um, built, loved books, built himself a library. All sorts of interesting people were librarians there. Um, Lessing, the philosopher, was, was the librarian for this place. So just imagine this quaint little German town uh, you know, with half-timbered houses and this magnificent library. And I just plopped myself there and said, okay, I'm going to spend two months and read everything. Um, they had pretty much everything. So it was mostly Latin. That's um, the, I work in a lot of languages, but this, this stuff just happens to be in, la in Latin. Um, and saw really, really fascinating arguments in there. And the books, you know, they, some of them, they're, they're, that's the only place they exist. You know, they were people's dissertations or they were polemical tracts or they were theological dissertations, some of them. Um, and for strange reasons, this argument, why are we fasting? What's the real purpose of it? Keeps coming back up in the Reformation era. Um, for, for reasons I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Um, and um, so I got through those months. I read maybe 50 books or so, um, got a pile of notes, and then I got interested in something else. I got sidetracked. Then I went back to it a couple of years later. I spent a summer in, um, in, uh, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, did more research, and then it sort of sat on the shelf. So I've got all these notes, and I haven't written a thing about it, really. I did a, I did a little article that went in a book called Food and Faith, but apart from that, um, it's never been used, and I keep thinking I just need to sit down, write the stupid thing, and get it done. Um, so that hasn't happened yet, and so part of the reason I'm talking to you about this subject is I'm trying to get enthused about it again, <laughs> and, and maybe not write another cookbook, although that's much easier and a lot more fun, and you know, the, it's, you know, academic writing is kind of tedious. You have to footnote every fart, and it's, you know, it's just, it's really, it takes really long time, and everything is meticulous, and, you know, and, and to, I don't know why I did this, but many of the notes I took are in Latin, so I have to go back and figure out what the hell I was talking about. So, in any case, but let me tell you why. Like, why did, the, why did this topic appeal to me in the first place? I had this thought that people in the past like to deny themselves as a kind of and I guess this sort of comes from Freud, maybe ultimately from Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher. He said there are ascetic people, and what's behind it? Because it seems completely bizarre and counterintuitive. Why would you take something that is an absolute biological necessity, eating, and say, I'm not doing that? And reproducing, I'm not doing that. Sleeping, I'm not doing that. I'm going to wake up all through the night and say prayers. These things, you know, they're the things that make us survive as a species. What would motivate someone to say, I don't want to do this, and then and then insist that other people do it also. Maybe not as rigorous, maybe not you know re fasting completely, um, but what would make them um, do this? And I thought it was kind of born out of spite. In other words, these are people who feel powerless, you know, kind of don't have. They're not strong or wealthy or whatever. But if they retire off somewhere, they can say, you know, you got you guys may have wealth and power and and all this, but in the end, in the afterlife. I'm going to be the one in heaven, and I'm actually going to be sitting there. Actually, St. Anselm says this. I'm going to be sitting there at the edge of the clouds, looking over at you down there in hell, and laugh. Ha ha! <laughs> you know, because it's a, so it's a kind of empowerment. And I think that's, that's one very particular kind of Freudian reading, at least, um, that has been applied to a cases of anorexia. And in fact, there's a, there's a fairly large literature on medieval anorexic girls who were fasting, some of them actually killed themselves, and the comparison to modern day fasting. I think um, Rudolf Bell did a book on this called Holy Anorexia. Um, it seems, it sort of makes sense. You think, okay, you know, modern anorexia is a kind of also power trip, right? It's for young women who don't have, who feel disempowered, who, you know, life is being decided for them, and what can they control? Their own bodies, right? Um, and it's a way of, of um, empowering yourself. And so, I think the, the comparison was a little too easy, and when you look at it, you know, what really motivated these young women in the past is not really power, certainly not beauty, it's not, you know, any sort of ideal of physical shape that's imposed upon them by the media, it's really the religiosity. So that kind of, you know, threw me for a loop looking at this, and, and, I'm, and the other thing which I, I have to mention just sort of in, as an aside, is there's still a really robust literature on fasting, like people do it today for spiritual reasons, 
partly to lose weight, I think, partly to gain control over their bodies, partly, there's, there's maybe, gosh, in the past decade, there's maybe 30 or 40 books that have come out just on fasting for spirituality, for health, for good looks, for whatever, for longevity, um, all sorts of things. So I think that this topic is gonna resonate in really weird ways with what's going on today. Um, and you might know also this fasting for, as a cleanse, right? People who do yoga and, you know, they will stop eating. Uh, presumably it makes you feel better, I don't know. Um, so let me, let me get into the logic of it. Why did people fast? And I'm going to talk about the sort of Judeo-Christian tradition, but if you, if you are interested, just say the word and I'll pop in some comparisons because they're, they're very interesting and, and different. So, um, so starting in the Old Testament, there are fasts all over the place, okay? And people generally do it when they have done something really, really bad. So it's, it's an act of personal atonement. And the logic of it is God's going to punish you for whatever you do bad. You might as well start punishing yourself just to show him you're really, really sorry and stop eating, throw ashes on your head, rip your clothes, you know, lay down in the dirt and say, I, you know, I'm really, really sorry, God, I won't do it again. And so it's an, it's an act of atonement. But that just means really, really being sorry. And there are cases all through the Bible of this. Um, uh, let me think of one. David is a very good example. You remember David sees Bathsheba, this naked woman, falls in love with her, sends her husband out to the front lines to fight, to die. And he does die there. And then he sleeps with her. Really, really nasty thing <laughs> to do. And David repents of this and he fasts. And he does this, you know, super heroic kind of, you know, heart renting hair, dirt and hair, everything. Um, and God says, oh, I guess you're really sorry. All right, I won't punish you. Um, and um, so that kind of thing happens all the time. Sometimes you have prophets who to, uh, you know, um, appease God's wrath, uh, just will, will stop eating. And they sometimes get other people to do it too. So what's strange about the Old Testament is that there are private fasts for personal wrongdoings, and there's also collective fasts. And this is something that we often forget because we remember the pilgrims and the Mayflower in the 17th century um, having a Thanksgiving. What we don't remember is that they fasted too. That was, that was, those are two opposite sides of the coin. Things go right, you have a Thanksgiving celebration, a feast. If things go bad, you, you say, everyone stop eating now. And what's really weird is that that could be because war is on the horizon. That could be because there is a political turmoil. It could be a drought. It could actually be a famine. I know that sounds completely perverse. There's no food, everyone stop eating. <laughs> you know, it's a fast, but let's avert God's wrath. And it, and it usually works. That's, that's sort of the Old Testament um, idea of, uh, of why you do fasts. And then there are eventually official days of atonement. The one that, that is probably the most um, important still to this day in, in Judaism is Yom Kippur, right? It's this, um, day of, uh, of fasting completely, so you don't eat anything, um, for 24 hours, well, it's not even 24 hours, it's sun down to sunrise, uh, sun, sorry, sunset to sunset the next day, right? So it's, it, if you're really strict about it, it's 24 hours, and you don't eat anything, and you sit around, and you mope, and you think about all the dreadful things you did that year, and, and it's, it's the same idea, it's atonement. And there are actually a couple of little other fasts, too. Tisha B'Av is one, which was just last week. Um, is sort of a remembrance of the destruction of the temple. So there's things like that that, that run through Judaism, but not really, um, there's not really an ascetic tradition in Judaism. That's what's weird, is people don't do this permanently. They don't like, um, except for one strange group of people um, who are um, Nazarenes. Um, and it's not, it has nothing to do with the word Nazareth. It doesn't come from the place. A Nazarene is a special person who dedicates themselves to God and they don't cut their hair, they don't eat meat at all, um, and they don't drink wine. So that makes them really, really strange among Jews because Jews drink wine ritually. Um, it's part of the Passover Seder. Meat is ritually sacrificed and that's part. So it, it's kind of like a, um, a, a kind of like a counterculture, this weird movement where people will, will um, dedicate themselves to God and stop eating meat. And it's, and it's sort of unusual. Um, there are, uh, the person who probably you'd be most familiar with is um, uh, who's the guy who who pushes the temple. The, uh, Samson doesn't cut his hair, right, and he doesn't eat meat or drink wine. So he's he's odd uh, in that respect. Um, and there's actually still one religious group that still follows these Nazarene principles, which you'd never guess in a million years. 
Rastafarians, right, the Ital, and, and they don't cut their hair, they don't eat meat, and it's, it's, it, they, they're Nazarenes, okay? they, they've dedicated themselves for the Old Testament reasons, you know, the Lion of Judah, all that. Um, so well, apart from the fasting, remember in Judaism you have this really, really complex food laws. Um, and I won't go into, into great detail about them, but um, just, to, just basically as a contrast to what happens in Christianity. So what ha just to sort of make sense of all of this, and there are lots of different ways you can, you can do this. Some anthropologists say, oh, this was, you know, pigs carry trichinosis, and that's why they didn't uh, eat them. Um, others will say, Marvin Harris said that this, pigs don't sweat, and there's not a whole lot of water, and they compete with humans for the same food resources, therefore um, pigs were, were banned because they're not economically viable in the Middle East. That's not true either. Um, there are lots of pigs there, <laughs> people. Um, it just so happens that Jews and Muslims don't eat them, but, um, but Christians do, and they do raise pigs, actually, in the Middle East. Um, so why, then? What's this ban on pork? And it's actually a lot more complicated than that. And I think the, the most compelling argument that I've heard comes from the anthropologist Mary Douglas in a very um, sort of astute article by uh, Jan Soler called the... Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, it's, a, it's a sort of the semiotics of Levitical food laws, something like that. And what he argues is that if you look back into the Old Testament, look at the Garden of Eden, what did Adam and Eve eat? They, they well, they didn't eat meat. They, they didn't kill anything. They didn't, uh, they did eat apples, but, um, but, and that's very telling, is you don't destroy the tree when you eat an apple, right? Um, they couldn't eat carrots. They were actually fruitarians. They destroyed nothing. They were completely innocent. They ate grains that came off of plants. They ate fruits from the trees. And, and God at one point says, um, you know, the fruits from the trees, here's the grain, this will be food for you. And they're perfectly happy with that. And so fruitarian is the technical term for, for what they do. Uh, of course, they mess it up, right? God puts this apple, uh, this uh, you know, tree in there, the tree of, actually there's two trees. There's a tree of the knowledge of good of evil, and there's another tree which will make them live forever. So after they eat that from that first tree, he says, uh-oh, we better get rid of them because they will eat that second tree too, and then they will be like the gods, like us. And why he says that, I don't know. This is a monotheistic religion, right? I mean, that's really, really perplexing, but, the, but it is plural in the original, and, and in, the, in the translations, it's plural, um, gods. So anyway, he kicks them out, and they, um, it's not really clear what they eat at that point, but um, presumably they're, they're, they're sh um, shepherds, so they you know, must eat the milk or whatever. But it's not really until um, they still, there's no meat eating mentioned anywhere in there, and it's really not until after the flood and after Noah that God finally says, you know what, these guys are going to keep messing up no matter what I do. Let me just make a concession to them. Let's let them kill. Let them do it. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not going to get around without killing, and they, they might as well eat meat. And so Noah is the first to eat meat, and also the first to, to grow vines. Remember, he plants a vineyard and gets drunk. And um, so that's really, um, uh, and his son uncovers him, and he sends him away. It's really, really strange, strange story. Um, but in any case, that's where meat first comes in, okay? It's after Noah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Is Noah doing all these crazy things before the flood or after the flood? It's after, after he plants vineyards and then they kill to eat meat. And it's, and it's also strange that Noah's the first one to make a sacrifice. He kills a bird. <laughs> that wouldn't seem weird. You've just gone through all this trouble to get them on the ark. You take them off and you kill one. <laughs> it's like, what's the point? So sacrifice is central to this whole thing also, is that you, um, and eventually it becomes ritualized. You know, when the book of Leviticus is finally written, they say you must take a blemish-free calf slaughter it on the altar, splatter the blood around, put the fat in the head on the fire, and the smoke goes up to God, and he smells it, and he goes, mmm, barbecue. And that's, that's how God gets fed. It's, he, doesn't, he doesn't have a body, he can't eat, but he enjoys, it is a soothing odor to the Lord, is what it says all over the place. So he really likes to smell barbecue, I guess that's the idea. And so the Jews have to take this these animals ritually sacrifice them. And, but what's the logic of this? What, what, how, do they exp how do the Levitical priests explain it? Is that the um, s killing is wrong. Always has been. Goes all the way back to Eden. And although God will let you do it now, it's still a sin and it has to be expiated. So expiation means punishment. And if we're not going to be punishing humans every time they kill an animal, we've got to punish something else. The guilt has to be transferred. This sounds really weird, but it's, it's, a, it's a very odd logic in the ancient world. It doesn't matter who's punished as long as someone or something is punished. So you take that guilt, you put it on the lamb that you slaughter, 
and it suffers. It gets the punishment. It is a scapegoat, literally, right? It suffers the punishment that you would have gotten. And then God says, ah, now justice is done. Everything's okay. So, so it's really a part, it's really the logic of this whole thing goes back to murder. Not, not oh, this is at least the anthropological explanation, is that murder is still forbidden. So if you kill to eat, you've got to expiate that sin. So what, what does this have to do with the pigs that I mentioned? Pigs are omnivores. They'll eat anything. They will eat animals. Um, they're, um, carnivores obviously don't expiate for their sins. So, so uh, birds, that wrap, birds of prey, raptors, um, anything that's wild and carnivorous, lions, tigers, whatever, they're all unkosher. Okay? And I think what they were thinking, the, the Levitical priests, is you know, no one's going to remember if we make this enormous list of what's good and what's bad. So let's just come up with a handy mnemonic device. Let's say some, an animal that chews its cud, which means, you know what that is, it's sort of, you know, the, it has several stomachs. So the food goes down, they throw it up, they chew it again. Doesn't sound like fun to me. And then they swallow it again. Actually, if you've ever seen a giraffe do it, it's hilarious. A little lump goes all the way up and then it goes down again. It's hilarious. But in any case, so, so giraffes are actually kosher, oddly enough. But in, in any way, it's, uh, they are. So the, um, so they figure if it chews its cud and has a cloven hoof, which means it's a ruminant. So, so a whole slew of things like camels are not, camels have toes, and horses are not because they have a solid hoof. And they figured if we qualify, if we have these two criterion, we're always going to get a, a, an herbivore. We're always going to get something that doesn't kill to eat, and then you'll know. Um, they made a couple of mistakes. They got rabbits wrong. <laughs> they got, um, and then there's, there's things in there that are... I shouldn't say they're inexplicable, but, but the logic, shellfish is also unkosher um, because the, um, there's a place where it says every animal is clean that moves in its environment according to its proper means of locomotion. So animals must have legs, fish must have fins, birds must have wings. That's, that's the sort of taxonomic logic of what is clean. Things that slither, snakes, things that um, fly but are mammals like bats, anything that is a taxonomic aberration. Again, this is Jan Solar's idea. Um, doesn't fit, so you make it unclean. So hence, pour all the shellfish and <laughs> it goes out. That's not kosher either. So, so, um, so in any case, this, all this stuff is, takes a lot of interpretation, despite the fact that it's um, you know, written down. And it's fairly clear, and you know, it's a handy mnemonic device, but, but you have to be conscious of what you're eating all the time. To this day, people who, you know, people who keep kosher. Um, other oddities is you can't mix milk and meat, so cheeseburgers aren't kosher either. Um, and, uh, and then there's, you know, there are rituals, the Passover Seder, the, the fasting on Yom Kippur, things like that that are in there. So it occurred to a handful of people, and this is in, in um, antiquity, that people were just sort of going through the motions of following these kosher rules and not really taking them to heart. You know, they're just doing them, but they don't understand why they're doing them. They're going through the motions. So there are sort of reform movements within Judaism, often this happens, that say we should really be focusing on being good to each other, not keeping kosher. It's, it keep kosher, but it's the, just following the laws is not enough. Uh, Hillel is probably the best, best example of this. It's a guy who, who um, it, this is a very funny story. He, um, a guy asks Hillel, so um, I want you, I make, I'm going to make you a bet, um, let's see if I get this right now, of can you stand on the, can you stand on one leg and tell me what's in the Torah, everything that's in it? If you can do that, I'll convert. And, and he's expecting, he's, you know, the Torah's five big books. <laughs> he's expecting he's going to read it and do a commentary on it. And Hillel says, okay, stands on one leg and says, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the whole thing. And he's done. <laughs> That's all you need to know. So it, in odd ways, it sort of prefigures what Jesus will say, right? And Jesus is kind of a reform movement that is not unusual. It's not unprecedented. And, um, and of course, there are people before him who, they, who people claimed were the Messiah. So you don't understand what a Messiah is. It's just a person who's supposed to come back down on earth, rule, um, re renew the kingdom of Israel, and um, bring a new era of peace. Um, so that's supposed to really happen, but, it, but it, there are before and after, actually. There are several Messiahs that come. So, so imagine that Jesus shows up, and he says the same kind of message. Um, Everyone is obeying the letter of the law, but not the spirit. Um, does God really care what goes into your mouth? 
No, he cares what comes out of your mouth. What you say is what defiles a person, not um, food. So this is kind of dicey material because remember the, the Pharisees, the, the official Jewish um, organization, um, really wants to keep hold of their populace there, but they're also under Roman overlordship. So they don't want to upset the Romans. Um, and it had happened before, uh, just a, about 150 years before all this, the um, Maccabees had a revolt against their um, Seleucid overlords. This is the Syrian Greeks who conquered the Holy Land, uh, and they had a, a revolt against them, and, and which was successful for several years. Um, so that, so that there's a touchy history there, and they don't really want to, the, the Jewish authorities don't want to upset the Romans, but they also don't want this guy walking around saying, don't worry about keeping kosher. Um, and it's not clear that he was or wasn't, okay? There's no, there's no passage in there that will say that. Um, but what is clear is that Jesus fasts, okay? He does a 40-day fast of no food whatsoever, okay? Which is miraculous. He goes into the desert, of course, and does this. And it is not unlike the Old Testament fasts that, that heroic figures do. Moses fasted. Um, I think Adam probably fasted too. So, this, like, so he's in that long line of, of tradition. And what's going to be interesting is how do people later deal with this? Because, you know, you and I can't fast for 40 days. It, it might kill you. Um, you know, and if you don't take food, water, you might be able to make it. But if you do, do no food or water, it's really, really dangerous. Um, I think that the Gosh, you know, when, when back in the 70s when I was a kid, do you remember Bobby Sands, the um, Irish? I think he lasted about 70 days. Um, but he, you know, fasting is a protest. It's another, another whole other topic, but that's, um, but people do it. And, and people do it, um, hunger artists do it for entertainment. <laughs> I know that sounds really weird, but there was a guy who put himself in a glass bubble hanging over the Thames and stayed there and didn't eat for, I think it was a month or something like that. So in any case, the... Um, so the 40-day fast is something that Jesus did. It's something the apostles did. But what was really important to these people, and I would say um, Peter more than anyone really shaped what Christianity would be. Uh, sorry, Paul more than anyone shaped what Christianity would be. Jesus never knew the word Christos. You know, he never heard that. He was never, Christos means the anointed. And it's, it's a, a translation of what would have been the Messiah uh, into Greek. Um, but there was no such thing as Christians until Paul used that term. And I think Paul's, you know, kind of big stroke of genius, really, in, in inventing this as a separate religion, remember Jesus didn't really know that he was creating another religion, was that, um, remember that scapegoat, the sacrifice to get rid of your sins? Well, Paul said, well, you know, normally when someone dies, the whole movement ends, right? That's, that, that's the end of it. Um, he says, no, actually, this was his sacrifice, he was being killed as the scapegoat, the scapegoat, as the Lamb of God, and now all your sins are washed away. You don't have to do sacrifice anymore. Okay, so that's, so it's taking literally that, the original law from Leviticus and just turning it around and saying it's now being fulfilled in a different way. We're now no longer in the age of law, we're now in the age of grace. Um, and the forgiveness comes to you, all you have to do is believe. Okay, that's, you know, simple. If you, I don't know whether you're familiar with this, but it's um, really pretty simple. And Paul said, you know, if we're going to get converts, we have to get rid of all those complex laws, which don't serve any purpose. The kosher laws, why are we doing this anymore? Get rid of the kosher laws, get rid of circumcision. And you can imagine, you know, you don't get many converts when you go around with a scissor. Why are we circumcised? You know, it just doesn't happen too often. So getting rid of circumcision, getting rid of all the really complex laws. And there are um, passages all throughout the New Testament where, um, Gosh, there's one really strange one. Peter has this dream, and um, God speaks to him. Uh, he says, it's, and it's teeming, there's a big net that's teeming with all sorts of unclean animals. And uh, God says, go ahead, Peter, eat this stuff. And he says, I can't eat that. That's not kosher. These are unclean animals. And God says, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. Do it. I said, it's okay. And so that, it's at that point, really, that the kosher laws are just wiped away, is that, that there are, for the early Christians, for the first couple of hundred years, there are no restrictions whatsoever, okay? No, no laws. You can eat whatever you want. If you take a personal fast, that's, that's okay, um, but you don't have to, okay? Now, it turns out that within this movement, and maybe even with historical precedents, it might go back to the um, Essenes, it might go back to some splinter groups, but there are people who actually go out into the desert in the first two centuries of Christianity, and say, I'm not eating, and I'm going to punish myself, and I'm going to thereby gain God's favor by avoiding 
uh, food. Um, not obviously can't do that long term, but many of them say, I'm not going to eat meat. I'm not going to drink wine. And actually, they're a very odd lot of people. I have to say, they're, um, I think here the, the spite origin really does make sense. There's a whole book called The Sayings of the Fathers, and these guys go out into the desert, and they consciously try to make their lives difficult. One guy will like take a glass of water, put it on the table, sit there in the hot sun, and say, I'm not drinking that. I have power. <laughs> I can do it. So it's, it's empowering, but it is, it's demented in a way, right? I mean, and they start these heroic sort of bouts of fasting where they will be competing against each other to see who can fast the longest, who can do the most disgusting thing, who can put their hands in dirty water. Because there's one, there's one phrase that I'd say when, I, when I'm in class and people just go, oh my God, there are these guys singing. And one guy is coughing and the monk starts to get annoyed and he's about to say, shut up, we're singing, you can't cough. <clears throat> and he hacks up a big loogie and it ends up on his sweater, on his cloak. And he thinks, okay, am I going to submit to wrath and yell at this guy? No. And he grabs it and he eats it. <laughs> so, so, and so it's kind of that, you know, level of, of disgustingness and see how long you can go without eating that becomes heroic, right? Um, now, why? What's the real logic of this? And I have an idea. Um, which, strangely enough, really comes but goes back to my understanding of the medical theories of the time. Um, if you, like, wh why would meat not be okay, but vegetables are? Like, wh what would be the logic of that? And, and immediately you might think, oh, well, you know, killing makes you mean, eating meat makes you bloodthirsty, blah, blah, blah. That's not it at all. Um, in the humoral theory, and this is Galen of Pergamum, he's actually contemporary with these guys. He died about 200. So, um, there is an idea that things which are very close to your own flesh and substance are very nourishing. So things like pork, it's very close to human flesh, therefore it's really, really nourishing. Wine is an analog of blood. It actually converts into blood really easily in your body. Um, and therefore it is really nourishing. So for people who get a lot of exercise, eating a lot of meat and red wine, um, their, their stomachs are strong enough, they can digest this stuff, um, that will be assimilated into their bodies and it will replace the parts that are wasted away from the exercise, okay? This is, this is just the, the Galenic logic of, of the humors. Um, and uh, so foods that are classified as sanguine, that's, you know how, how this classification system works? Some foods are hot and moist, therefore they're sanguine, some colds are Foods are cold and dry, they're melancholic. Some are cold and moist, they're phlegmatic, and some are hot and dry, they're choleric. And oddly enough, you know, we still use those terms to describe personality types, right? A choleric person is angry and prone to, you know, outrage. A person who's phlegmatic doesn't care and they're lazy and the phlegmatic humors. And a person who's melancholic, obviously sad, and a sanguine person is cheerful and ruddy, right? So, so what you eat and the exercise you get and the sleep you get and all these, these sort of dietary factors go into making what you what you are. But if you are a healthy person and well-nourished and you eat a lot of meat, um, th your muscles are repaired, you, um, the excess of nutrition will turn into sperm. And this is in both men and women, okay? This is, I know this sounds really weird. They believed both sexes have sperm and that a really well-nourished person, once the blood has been replenished, once the flesh has been you know, revived, it, um, it gets stored as sperm, um, which is really very, it's, I know this sounds really bizarre, but it's very dangerous for women not to be married when they're, when they're of reproductive age, because this kind of, kind of backs up, I guess. They get green sickness, I know. So, and, the, and the prescription is always get that woman married, you know, and she'll, then she'll be better. I know it sounds totally bizarre, but... Um, but the logic of this is, um, and you know, the other thing, which is, I guess I'll just throw this in, is that the um, Galenic model of sexual difference is that if the man, if, the, if in reproduction, the men, man and woman are healthy and well-nourished and kept warm and everything, um, then the uh, fetus will become perfect. It'll, it'll be an extension, it will be, um, it'll be an Audi, so to speak. If, if something goes wrong and someone's sick or cold or whatever, um, the genitals aren't fully formed, they are innies. So men and women are opposites of, of each other. Now that's not true, but no one, believe it or not, figures that out until the 16th century. So, um, and there's actually even stories, God, Montaigne tells the story of this young woman, jumps over a big puddle, lands on the other side, and her 
<laughs> genitals come out, she becomes a boy. Really, and people just <laughs> believe this, which I find amazing. So in any case, what does this have to do with, with the fasting stuff? So if you are trying to be celibate, what's the last thing you want to eat? Meat, right? And wine, because those are going to replenish your flesh, become sperm, and stimulate your libido. So the avoidance of meat, the original logic of this is completely medical. It's, it's that you, um, if you eat cold and dry vegetables and things that are sour and styptic, those are, those are um, categorized as, cold, as melancholic, um, you're never going to get to that. They're not nourishing. That's, that's what, and fish also. Fish is phlegmatic. It's cold and moist. So you're never really going to have to worry about um, excess um, nutrition or stimulation of the libido. So, so it has nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with um, not wanting to kill animals or feeling bad for them. Although there are people around who do that, in fact. Um, you know, you might know uh, Pythagoras, you know, Pyth the Pythagorean theorem. He, Pythagoras was a really cool guy. He, was, he went with all of his buddies to southern, what's now southern Italy, and hung out there and strummed guitars, literally, you know, the octaves <laughs> is his invention, um, and didn't eat meat because they thought that the souls of the dead would be revived in animals. So he saw this little puppy and he said, that's my friend, I recognize his voice. And so it's really, and he, and he also wouldn't eat beans, which is, which is even stranger. Um, this is my weird theory about this, but it's um, that when beans come out of the ground, the roots go into the soil and they have a sort of symbiotic relationship with a, with a bacterium called rhizobium, which attaches to the nodules in the roots. And when you pull it up, it has what's called leg hemoglobin in it. It bleeds. It, red blood will come out of the roots of a fava plant. And I think Pythagoras probably thought this is the way souls transmit from the, from the underground up through the plant's hollow stems, and that's how people are reborn. So he said, do not eat beans. You're gonna kill people um, who are waiting to be reincarnated. So, so, so there are vegetarians in the ancient world. Most of them are not doing it for caring about animals. Um, I think the only one is probably Plutarch. Who Plutarch said, you know, if you are really bloodthirsty, and you want to eat an animal, go ahead and jump on its back. Tear it, tear it apart with your bare hands. That's, that's what you need to do if, you, if you're really going to you know, have to eat meat. Um, it's not fair you know, if we use knives and things and can kill them. Do it, do it with your bare hands. See how far you get. <laughs> it was, um, Plutarch's cool. But in any case, no vegetarians uh, in the past. And in fact, what happens if a holy order like the Carthusians suddenly say, well, meat is bad. We're never going to eat it. What happens? That's actually heresy because all food is good. As it, you know, God made every food, it's all good for you. And there are places where he says, all food is, is fine to eat. So you can do it often and you can fast for long periods of time, but you can't officially say, we don't eat meat. It is heresy, okay, um, officially. So I guess, you know, why that bears upon Seventh-day Adventists today and, and vegetarian movements within modern Christianity. It's, it, Technically, it's heresy. So, uh, and, the, and the other reason is that the, the Cathars, who were a medieval her heretical group, um, or Albigensians, as they're sometimes called, um, also were vegetarians. And they believed that the whole world was divided into good and bad matter. And this world is bad. And, and everything in it is bad. So if you starve yourself, that's perfectly fine. And they did, many of them. So, so I think the Carthusians kind of got a bad rap because of their, their ideas sounded like the, the Cathars. So where am I going with all this? So these are still ascetics we're talking about, who, to, who you know, avoid meat and go out in the desert or up on columns. St. Simeon perches himself on a column and never comes down. I love him. And um, people have to bring him food, obviously, but he fasts for long periods of time, St. Anthony in the desert. And then it becomes the, the and, and there are authors who write about this. St. Jerome, I think, is really the most interesting. St. Basil also. Um, Chrysostom writes a, a treatise on fasting, as does... Um, Tertullian, right? It's a really nice one. So, so all of a sudden, the church fathers are getting in on this and saying, you know, this fasting idea is really good. Let's institute it officially. Let's, let's take a period of time, let's say a 40-day period, because that's Jesus fasted for that period. Let's put it up before the um, Easter when God is resurrected. And let's just, let's take, take it from um, good Friday, what is it? It's um, Ash Wednesday 
all the way up through Easter, that 40 day period, let's officially say people have to fast. But we know they're not gonna completely avoid food, but let's have them avoid the stuff that's really gonna make them horny. Let's, let's keep the meat away. Um, wine they tried, it didn't work in the long run, but if you were in a monastic community, you, you avoided wine. Um, and let's, let's have it be an official period of penitence when we can, um, and, and let's, let's also do it um, on the vigils of saints days. Let's do it um, at what are called the quatuor tempori, the, the equinoxes and the solstices. Let's do it. So they're, they're trying hard to, um, to make fast, put fasting in the calendar. And the way it develops in the course of the, let's say from the fifth through about the 10th century is the fast days make up about a third of the calendar. They're, they're um, 150 days or so out of 365. So um, it's a lot of time. And of course, if you're a butcher, you're out of, you can't, you don't work during those days. Um, you have to close shop. And the officials kind of go along with this. They like the idea. Um, people have to eat fish. They complain too. Oddly enough, people really think they're going to get sick during that period because it's, it's a cold um, months, right? It's February through March or somewhere in there. It moves around. Um, and their fear is this is a cold phlegmatic season. We're supposed to eat fish. We're all going to get colds and coughs. Um, that's, I think it's a real fear on their part. And what they do is when this gets instituted, we're talking 1,000 years later. Okay, let's, let's move up the story. Is everywhere has a fast. It's, a, it's an official thing. You have to do it. If you don't, the uh, magistrates can throw you in jail. Okay, so it's, it's a real, they, people take it very, very seriously. But having said that, you can always buy a dispensation. You can say, I am really weak, I need meat, or I'm gonna get sick. Um, you could, a pregnant woman can get a dispensation. Someone who's elderly and needs excess nu extra nutrition can just buy this dispensation. And sometimes you can actually, um, a whole town can buy a dispensation for a specific ingredient. So for example, the town of Rouen in the 15th century says, we are swimming in butter here and we can't eat it during Lent. This is ridiculous. Let's pay some money. Let's uh, have people pay into a common fund. We'll send it into the, into the church. We'll get this and we'll buy a dispensation for, uh, to allow us to eat butter. And in fact, that builds a tower on the Cathedral of Rouen, all the butter money. Um, it's called the butter tower for, for that very reason. So cities buy dispensations. And I should mention also something is, you know, I'm not talking about the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is actually much more, much stricter than the Western. Um, many more fast days, and there are some to this day where you can't eat any fat, so even olive oil is forbidden. And there's, there's, um, it's called, gosh, what's the word? In, 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 in Greek, it's xerophagy, which just means dry eating. So you don't eat any fat at all for, for a long period. But in any case, what, back to the West. Um, so let me, let me give you a couple of little stories that I'm, I'm going to sort of wind, wind into what event will eventually become a book on this. Um, the guy, the person who is really the greatest scholar of the early 16th century, this is immediately preceding the Reformation, uh, is Desiderius Erasmus. And you, you might have heard of the pra In Praise of Folly or his colloquies, which are really just brilliantly lovely and funny and hilarious, but very serious also. And in fact, he wrote a, a little dialogue uh, called Ichthyophagy, which means fish eating. And it's an argument between a butcher and a fisherman who wonder what would happen if we got rid of the laws of Lent. Uh, and the butcher says, well, the fisherman says, well, you know, meat would not be such a big deal anymore because everyone could eat it at all times. They would eat fish. And the butcher says, you know, people hate fish, though. You go out of business tomorrow. <laughs> so, so it's this weird argument and eventually becomes this whole theological discourse that questions, why are we fasting anyway? Because look, folks, it's not in the New Testament. There's nowhere does it say people should fast. And it certainly doesn't spe specify exact times. And it certainly doesn't say no meat. You know, so this is, this is a big question for Erasmus. And I think the most interesting thing is Erasmus, um, you know, complained about a lot of, let's just call them clerical abuses. And this is on the eve of the Reformation. So things like simony, you could buy a church position for, your, uh, for a relative. Pluralism, you could hold lots of different church positions and never show up at them. Uh, ignorance, monks who would, you know, say the prayers, uh, not really understanding Latin, not knowing what they were saying. So there's things like that, which, and there's, in fact, to this day among scholars, there's a really big argument. Were the 
was the church really corrupt through and through? Did it need to be reformed? Um, there's evidence that suggests no. People stayed, still gave money. They were still very happy about what was going on. And this may have just been this uh, you know, elite intellectual movement that was complaining about it, as happens in all religions. You have periods of revival and, refer and renewal. Um, let's look at the, not the letter of the law, but the spirit of it. So I think that you could look at it both ways, why the Reformation happened. But in any case, Erasmus, oddly enough, poor Dutchman, hated fish, could not stand the smell, the sight of it. He just, he, it just drove him bananas and he um, couldn't eat it. And so he officially bought a dispensation from the church. He paid money. Anyone can do this. You just put money on the table, you're allowed to eat meat. Uh, and what happens is, but he doesn't really want to boast about this or make a big deal of it because he's really very critical of the church. And, and, uh, and what he sees is hypocrisy, or he sees as these accretions of tradition. And part of really what the, why the Reformation happens is people say, we need to be looking at the New Testament again, look at the book, and forget about all these ridiculous traditions, because they're really just for making money. Um, and when he's writing, I should also mention, from the 1490s, the Pope at the time, this is uh, Rodrigo Borgia. If you saw the, the bad TV series, The Borgias, it's him. It's Jeremy Irons. <laughs> it's in my head permanently as, as um, Alexander VI says, we need to rebuild the Vatican, folks. Um, let's start raising money now. Let's, so however we can do it, sell indulgences. You've all heard of these, you know, Martin Luther, the, the penny flies in the box and the soul spirit jets out of purgatory. Um, you're, you can basically buy your salvation. <laughs> but we forget dispensations are also part of that. Is, is, um, uh, the indulgences are one side, but a dispensation is a physical piece of paper that says, you may eat meat. <laughs> don't arrest this guy. You produce your papers while you're chomping on your hamburger and you say, it's fine, don't worry, I have this. So Erasmus bought this because he hated fish. And one day he's at this friend's house, a bishop, I think this is in Basel, uh, Bishop Zazius. And it's Lent. Everyone's eating fish. And Erasmus starts to swoon. <laughs> and he does. And Zazius brings him out a chicken and says, here, eat this. I know you have the dispensation. And, all, and Erasmus says, no, uh, really. I, and he feels so bad about it. You went out of your way to make this chicken for me, and, and no, I'm going to eat it while no one else can. He felt really bad about the whole situation. And so he leaves, and he says, I, you know, put it away, and I, I don't know what he expected to do with it. Um, but someone at that dinner said, complained about the whole thing, and maybe they ate the chicken. I don't know what happened to it. It doesn't say. But Zazius gets called before the authorities. He has to defend himself. What were you doing serving chicken? And Erasmus hears about this and writes him back a letter and saying, I'm really sorry. I know you acquitted yourself and explained the whole situation, but the fact that you got dragged before the magistrates, I really, really feel bad about this. Um, so it's, it's a touchy subject right on the eve of the Reformation. And what happens, I've led you right up to the point, and I'm almost out of time, but in any case, what happens is the, um, really the, the story comes to a head in Zurich. This is um, the... Lutheran Reformation had happened just a few years before. So Martin Luther um, that might have actually rejoined the church, but he officially broke away after the 95 Theses are nailed to the door in Wittenberg. Um, and the authority of the Pope is denied, denounced, um, basically because the Elector of Saxony protects him physically. He would have been called to Rome and absolutely without doubt would have been burned there. But the Elector says, I want to keep my power. You know, this was personal self-aggrandizement, I think. Um, but that all happened a couple of years later. But Luther really didn't care about stuff like this. In fact, there's a, there's a theological term in Greek called adiaphora, which means stuff that doesn't matter. Luther was actually looking at Paul and his original statement that, um, that what really matters is faith. You don't have to do works, right? I mean, that's the whole center of everything Luther did was that it doesn't matter whether you fast or give money or make us go on a pilgrimage or say the mass or all that stuff. You, you, they're not harmful, but if you think that doing those things earns you salvation, that's really presumptuous. You can't earn your salvation. And you certainly can't pay for it, right? If you put money in the box and expect to get it to heaven, it means the wealthiest people will buy their salvation. So, he, so the crux of what Luther is doing is saying that, um, and it goes back, right back to Paul, is that faith is what really saves you. It's, it's a doctrine called sola fide, all by faith alone, you are saved. Um, but Luther doesn't care. If there are bishops, fine. If you say a kind of mass, fine. He thought, thought the text should be in German, so he translated it himself. But the sort of mechanics of church government and how the thing was going to work, he didn't really care about that. It was not important to him. Um, the Swiss reformers are very different. And what happens, I know this is going to sound weird to you, but I'm going to make the thesis that 
after Luther, the Reformation goes the direction it does and actually splits into many denominations over a plate of sausages. <laughs> this is going to sound really weird. There's a, a printer in Zurich. His name is um, Froschauer. This is during Lent. It's March, really cold day. He gets an enormous order to print up some material. And his workers say, we're not, we're, we feel weak. We've been eating vegetables. We need nourishment. It's cold. We're freezing. Give us something to eat. Now, why he did this um, in direct, fla directly flouting the city's rules, um, no one really knows. But he said, OK, guys, we're having sausages today and brings it out in open defiance of the rules, I think intentionally provoking the, um, the magistrates. And of course, word gets out that they ate the sausages, they did the job, but, um, but Froshar gets pulled before the court and says, why are you serving sausages during Lent? You can't do that, no dispensation. I think they were looking to get paid maybe, but the Bishop of Zurich says, you're in big trouble now. And everyone begins to think, wait a minute. So the church made these rules, they can make dispensations for them. They can make money off of this whole thing. It seems like real hypocrisy, right? This is a way to raise money. And one individual steps up. This is Ulrich Zwingli. People know, heard his name? He's the father of the Swiss Reformation, um, preceding Calvin, Calvinism. And Zwingli says, look, if we are going to the sola fide part, he believes in, but he also says if we're going to have a, a really reformed church, we have to go by the letter of the law. Literally the letter of what the book itself, what it says. It says, the, here's, the, here's the complete guide to what you need to do. Why are we making up other stuff? And folks, look closely. There are no fasts in there. There's no, there's no official day, no official. There are voluntary fasts and there's public fasts, but the ones in the New Testament look like the Old Testament ones. So he says um, that the fasting rules are made by man. They don't bind anyone. If we're gonna, and this is, you know, obviously the roots of what we would today call fundamentalism, right? Believing that if it's in the text, you must do it. If it's not in the text, you don't do it. It's, it's wrong. Um, and he says that um, the fasts should be abolished. He's the first real th serious theologian who comes out and says there's no reason for us to be doing these. Um, the uh, city of Zurich actually gets thrown into turmoil for this. They have a revolution against their bishop. Um, they kick him out. The, the papal armies come back. Z actually, Zwingli dies in battle with a, a, an ax in one hand and the Bible in the other, which is really gruesome, admittedly. But, um, but the generation that follow, I think, um, especially um, Martin Bootser and a guy with who, a theologian who has the best name on earth, I think, is Ecolum Padius, <laughs> spelt with an O. But, but Calvin is in this whole, whole troop. And they reinvent um, uh, Protestantism, basically, in a way that's very different from Lutheranism because they really are interested in church government and they really are interested in, um, in rules <laughs> and laws. Uh, now, they're not the, the same ones as the Catholics had. They decide that if a person wants to do a personal fast, Wonderful, go ahead, do it. Penitence, it's in all through the Old Testament, Jesus did it. But there are also times when we need to have public fasts, when the magistrates will declare, okay, everyone, we're not eating because we're about to go to war, or we're not eating because the bank, the uh, government is bankrupt, or something has gone wrong, let's pray for God's um, leniency. So the oddly, the, uh, pro the, the Calvinists, Protestants, the Reformed tradition, ends up, their fasts end up looking a lot like the um, Old Testament ones, which is weird, and very little like, now the, the, the Catholic Church decides, well, if they're going that direction, we're going the exact opposite direction. We're gonna restress fasting, we're gonna restress the, the images and the sound and the music, and the, so churches become, in the, especially late, latter 16th century, and into the Baroque, beautiful, magnificent, aesthetic places, whereas the Calvinist ones become very simple, white, clab, you know, white wood, all the images are taken down, because doesn't it say, you know, don't, th thou shalt not bow down to engraven images, um, shalt not take the Lord's name in vain, I mean, all this stuff they take literally, they, they are biblical literalists. Um, I don't know, and you know, sometimes if the New Testament doesn't say something, they'll go back to the Old Testament. Um, I don't know why they never think, consider going kosher again, but they don't, <laughs> nor is any modern fundamentalist as far as I can tell. But it's, um, but it's interesting that what happens in those Protestant countries is that fasting, because it's not official or enforced, just gradually sort of fades away. It disappears in a way that um, you find people doing it in the 17th century, but um, but by the 18th, no one takes it seriously. And an odd exception to this whole um, scenario 
is that England keeps the fast, even though uh, official fast, even though they go Protestant, um, they keep what is really still the Catholic fast. Uh, I think as a way to kind of Elizabeth sort of trying to um, steer what's called a via media between the two extremes, but you could be Catholic there and um, and fast and not not be suspect. And her logic was that this was a, and actually it precedes her, it goes back to Henry VIII actually, but it um, the logic was that if we don't make people eat fish, they won't, and there will be no fishing fleet, there will be no defense of our coasts, our navy will fall apart. So it's called a political fast, okay? It's just for expediency, we need ships, therefore we must keep fishermen happy, um, so forcing them. Um, and that stays in place for a long time. In fact, when Parliament opens well into the 19th century, they still have a fast, oddly enough, uh, before it. But, but ordinary people just don't do it anymore, they forget about it. And the Catholic Church, you know, sort of uh, on the other side, restressing it, that lasts all the way up until um, 1964. That's when they finally say, you know, you don't have to have fish on Friday. Um, you know, f well, actually the original fast day was Saturday, um, but, but it was the Friday night that you start fasting and so you don't have meat, you have that one meal of fish. Um, and people still do it, you know, for, I don't think they understand why they do it, but it's still, still in place. Um, and, uh, but nowadays you can actually substitute something else. You can give up something else. It doesn't, doesn't have to be food. It can be any, any kind of sacrifice. Um, I don't have much time to talk about the people who I'm talking about, but let me mention a couple of them because what's sort of to, to close off this story, um, I started by saying that research has changed dramatically. And let me tell you one, one story. There's a, a theologian named Jeremiah Drexel who wrote this book called Allo Amari that mean, means bitter aloes, tastes bitter, but it's really good for you. He's advocating fasting. And he's really uh, hilariously, I think he's funny actually in a weird way. He, in fact, he says, um, you know, when you eat a lot and really enjoy your food, your palate kind of gets jaded. Like, you, like if you use a lot of salt or spicy food, you have to keep adding more and more to enjoy it, right? Does anyone here is a chili head. I think he's absolutely right. You know, you put it on one shake, tomorrow you need two, the next day it's three, and you get to a point where you really just have to stop. You can't taste anything anymore. Um, and he says, you know, try and see what happens. And if you go without a meal, um, you will, uh, uh, you know, skip a meal, fast for a day. When you come back, the food will taste much better. You'll, your senses will be far, far more acute. And he says there are a million reasons to do fasting, penitence, whatever, you know, atonement. But it's an aesthetic thing for him too. Um, and in fact, he knows really uh, a lot about Baroque cooking. Uh, he describes it uh, in detail, interestingly enough. Like I know the cookbooks that, that would have been come from the same place. But in any case, I was... When I was in Wolfenbüttel, um, reading this copy of the Allo Amari, the, um, I saw, I, I was thinking, is this a wise use of my time? Maybe there's a version out there. And I actually found one on ABE Books. It was, I think, about $1,500. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, and I actually don't own any old books. There's, there's no, I just, I'm not a, I love to have them, but I don't fetishize them that way. And I thought for a minute, you know, I'm, if it takes me a week to read this, and I have a $5,000 grant, whatever, does it make sense for me to sit here, take notes, when I could actually just buy the book, right? Own it, bring it home, have it forever. So I prevaricated over this and I thought, ah, I don't really need it. I'll take notes, it'll be fine. Um, about six months ago, I was poking around on Amazon. It's there for 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a it's a you know Xerox copy. You can order it, print on demand. It's on Google Books, and I would say that for um, from the time when I started this project to now, I bet you maybe fifty percent of the material is on Google Books for for free. And I can do that research in, in my office for nothing, you know, very simply. The, the weird and ironic thing is that the English material often isn't. The, anything Latin, it'll be there. The English material, strangely, was put into this system called Early English Books Online, which if you're part of a really wealthy university like Berkeley, you can get it. It's, you know, it's there online for nothing. If you're part of a small private university like mine, Pacific, you don't. So oddly, I, um, when I was at Harvard doing work, they said, take whatever you want. Use the system, put it on a thumb drive. So I own all this stuff. I stole it. And they said, it's fine. We don't mind. It's, we, we have the license. But, but if you didn't have that and you went online, oddly, the the literature that there's the le least of is the English stuff. Um, and the stuff in English, and the stuff in Latin and French and Italian is really easy to find because it's, there was never a company that, that charged for this stuff. Um, so the, I don't know what to say to end all of this, but um, let me say that, that the, um, 
sort of broader implications of, of this project, um, because I'm actually still prevaricating over whether I want to cover just the 16th and 17th century, which I haven't talked about at all here, the, who those authors are. No, they're really fascinating people. Um, but they argue basically what I've just said. Um, or whether I want to make it a much bigger sort of popular book about fasting in general and do the whole history and take it right down to the present and talk about the weird diets today and the um, something I haven't mentioned also is there's a whole strange phenomenon of fasting girls and they don't do this for religious reasons. They stop eating. I think it's a kind of anorexia, um, but they're people write books about them. You know, they, they in the 16th, 17th century, um, these examples of miraculous fasting young girls who stop eating um, and stay alive, which is really not just fascinating that it might happen, but that people wanted to read about that. They were really fascinated by the phenomenon and it lasts all the way up until the 19th century. In fact, there's um, um, Joan Jacobs Brumberg wrote a really good book on it. I think it's called Fasting Girls, something like that. But that's another side to this whole thing. Why do people fast? Do they do it for political protest? They, do they do it for spiritual or physical cleansing? Do they do it as, um, as a way to gain control over their bodies? I think so. Um, so I'm going to try. I, I still, you know, the person, <laughs> the one, one publisher told me as, as I was sort of going through the pros and cons of both sides, I don't have to write the book. So I think it'll, you know, just be, if I do it the, the stuffy academic way, it'll make me feel good, but no one will read it. If I do the, um, you know, the, the broader topic, um, it'll sell more and I think maybe have some resonance. And this um, one publisher from um, Oxford says, do both. Just write the one you have to for your, for your intellectual reasons and then go back and do a, a broader popular one. For, so, so both of them might come out in the next, I don't know, few years. I think that's it. So uh, thank you. If you have questions, let me know and I'll try to answer them. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're at an hour, so I don't know. However long, you, you. I have two questions. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. My two questions, and any order, please. Um, one is, um, you mentioned that you don't have Yeah. yeah, a person would be the healthiest, but it's called cannibalism. It's against the law. You can't kill people and eat them. Um, but but Galen actually says the most nourishing food would be human flesh. It converts the most easily into other. We just can't do it. <laughs> you know. So, um, but the but the other question is really intriguing. I have never seen anyone mention smells or or actually going out and saying I can't eat, but I think I'm going to smell some spices because you know there's kind of spice obsessed in that period, and things a much much broader palette of spices than we have today even. There are things that they would have used, which today I guess you'd only really find in Southeast Asian cooking, like galangal root and grains of paradise and cubebs, and they're really, really into spices. Um, but I think that the, the ultimate, if someone were to have to make a judgment on that, they'd say they're not nourishing because you don't, you're not eating, it's aroma. So you can sm go smell all you want, <laughs> you know. Um, but I've never heard anyone talk about that. It's interesting though. Is a Galen's conception of hot and cold food similar to the Chinese conception of hot and cold food? Because they're, they're eating, you know, through history is very medicinal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I hear my wife talk about, oh, that's hot food. And, you know, it's something you eat cold, but it's got a different uh, sense for how it affects your body. Yeah, you find systems like this all over the world. So I think the ones, there's a big argument over whether there is mutual influence of one system on the other. Um, I think the best argument is probably between Ayurveda and Greek humoralism because there is con real contact there. And then that might have gone through Tibet with Buddhism and influenced China. And then might have been when the Mongols took over this whole region, they also took over what's now Iran, where they, where, which is the, the, you know, one of the birthplaces of humoral theory. Um, so they would have gotten it directly. And in fact, there's a really interesting Chinese book um, called the Benkao Gangmu, which is, um, I think, 15th century. It's basically Galenic medicine uh, written in Chinese for, for Chinese people. So, so they do, there is influence, but in terms of like, when you look at how they're actually, what they're actually talking about, how, how they classify foods, they're really, really different. Um, rice will be cold in one tradition and hot in another, or it'll be, you know, so there's no consistency of what the, um, 
what the food's values are um, um, across the systems. But the, but the influence is there. And I think the, the best sort of example of this would be um, Avicenna, you know, um, or Ibn Sina would be his name in Arabic, was a um, 10th century Muslim from Samarkand. So he's on the spice route. All those ideas and spices and silk go across. Um, he's right on it. He ends up in Iran. He's actually second after Galen, second most important writer. Um, and what's really fascinating is his theories are the still the only living um, tradition of ancient Greek humoralism still practiced. It's called Unani medicine, meaning Ionian. You know, it's the, it's the coast of Greece. Uh, that's in, in India. So the, the Ayurvedic system is indigenous Hindu. The Unani system is Muslim. Um, which were, and so people really still practice humoralism. But the other side of the sorry, this is like, like one of my big research um, things, is the, the other, I think, more interesting argument is, is South America. Because there, clearly the Spanish bring humoral theory, but there was actually an indigenous system already in place. Um, and if anyone knows George Foster from here in Berkeley, um, had the theory that the, the system in, in the New World is entirely Hippocratic. It's just the Spanish bring it, plop it down. Um, I have written against that idea. I think if you look at the details of what's in the Mexican system, completely different. Um, and, there's, and the original system doesn't has hot and cold, but it doesn't have dry and moist access. So I think they're, they're very different systems. Uh, um, have you ever found anything that supports the idea that fasting correlated to Lent? Because that was the end of winter and there was less food available. Yeah. And also maybe to, to reduce women's potential for um, Children yeah, no one thinks it through logically, or at least they don't say they're doing so. Um, but if you think of when your food really starts to run out, um, actually spring is even is the worst time because you, you haven't planted yet, everything you put off for the winter. Um, but why people couldn't keep cured meat around and just keep it for February, I don't know. Um, but that I've heard that logic, um, and it could be. You know, it's it's. It is the time when you have the least food. The, you know, the other weird thing that just sort of sp jumped into my mind as you were talking about, about sort of a you know, biological basis for this is you know there are people who say humans are supposed to eat little bites all through the day because that's what we were like when we were foragers. Um, but if you think about hunting and gathering, sometimes you get a really big meal and sometimes you go for days without anything. And I think our systems can adapt to that very, very easily. Um, it's not hard to go without food for several days, in fact. Um, you know, I think our, our systems are adaptable in that way that, you know, if you I, try it, you know, you, you can actually, after a day or so, you, you really don't feel hungry anymore. It's weird. Yeah, question. During the medieval period, Hildegard, mm. uh, wrote a lot about the humors and about yeah. women's bodies and behavior. Did she come in on this fasting? Was there a lot of writing? Yes. There's a ton. Hildegard of Bingen, who is um, an herbalist and... Uh, mystic and she's, she's a great writer, lovely. Um, yes, they write a lot about it and there's a, a fantastic book written by one of my advisors, oddly enough, um, is Carolyn Walker Bynum. Uh, it's called, um, <sighs> I can't remember the name now, but it's, it's about uh, the spiritual meaning of food to women in the late Middle Ages. Um, B-Y-N-U-M, Bynum. N-U-M. And it came out in the 80s. It's actually among the first books that are kind of food studies, you know, before that became popular, which it is now. It wasn't certainly when I was in grad school. Um, what is the name of that book? Um, I can't remember. Anyway. Back to the um, reasons for fasting. Mm -hmm. The purposes of it. Does the literature talk about people explicitly using it to bring about altered mental states, like chemically altered, you know, go out and fast so that I see visions, or are they explicit about that, or is that just something that happens? I think it happens. They don't talk about it. Um, I don't think that physiologically they understand that you can hallucinate. For like, yeah, yeah, it does. Well, you self, you auto intoxicate, you know, as a way of, you know, your endorphins, you know, it's like when you run and all of a sudden you, your foot hurts and then it doesn't after a while. It's your body in, re, sort of releases these drugs that, tell you, that make you feel fine. Um, the pain that you would feel from serious fasting, your body does the same thing um, and doesn't make you feel it. And drug literally drugs you. You know, these are, these are internal opiates that... Um, but they never acknowledge 
Well, they don't know why it happens. Right, right. They think, you know, if, if they mention it at all, they'll say, well, this person was had a vision and God spoke to them or an angel came to them and said, you know, good job. Don't eat that chicken leg. Just leave it there and torture yourself. You know, things, things that are, um, but yeah, but they don't, they don't understand, you know, the, um, there are people who think that the, um, a lot of the ecstatic visions are caused by drugs, um, intentionally or unintentionally eaten. Things like ergot, which is um, rye infected by a fungus that is basically lysergic acid. So if you take that, uh, if it doesn't kill you, you have really serious visions and St. Anthony's fire and you know, it's, it's but there's, there's a, what's the name of this um, author? Avakian, I think, it's called Poisons of the Past. And her theory is that people ate a lot of poisonous things and were always tripping. Um, I don't know whether that's true, but might explain some things, you know. Hmm? Are, you, are you going to include Ramadan in your second book? And the, the reason I ask is um, I teach in a Catholic school and fasting doesn't come up too much because Catholics today only fast two days a year, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Mm. And you don't start till you're age 21. But actually, my Muslim students, it comes up a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have them come up to me and say, can I call my dad to get permission to eat? You know, so be interesting to know more. Yeah, the popular version would definitely include it. If the, you know, the scholarly narrow one, it's just not in the purview of it. And, and I really don't, I don't know a whole lot about it, to tell you the truth. You know, I'd have to find out more, but it's, yeah. And, and I, you know, my knowledge of it really just extends as far as, um, practice today, but the original logic of it, I'm not actually sure of why it happened. Um, do you have any uh, background information too on not the European, but the indigenous people, the fasting that they did historically? You mean indigenous to America? Um, yeah, it's, it, I think this ties in exactly to the question we just had before, is, is that in that case, there is drug use, peyote and, um, and psilocybin, and you go on a vision quest to find your purpose, but you, you, you fast. And, um, and I think it's, it's kind of, I think it's safe to say that a lot of hunter and gather societies have rituals like that. Siberians have the magic mushrooms, you know, <laughs> what's really weird about it is one guy will eat them and it's, it isn't metabolized. So it actually comes out of your pee. So everyone else drinks the pee. And, and as, as trips also, which is weird, but that's a shamanistic kind of religion. But, but I think that, that in that case, they are intentionally trying to, um, to have a hallucin hallucination, to, an out-of-body experience is considered sacred, right? Um, the Aztecs did that a lot. Um, and I think most Native American, and, and so did the ancient Greeks, you know, they had the, the Eleusinian mysteries and the cult of Dionysus and getting drunk or stoned was part of the whole ecstatic experience, right? Stasis is when you are in your place. Ecstasis is when you leave, the, leave your body, basically, and become one with everyone else. Um, and you find that in so many early religions. Um, and not eating is, is often part of that. Another question? Nay? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was fun.